Hello, this is National Chess Master All Rats at chess.com. I'm here to cover a simultaneous be being given by National Master Chiron Griffith. It is played at the time control 25 5. So far, one game has started. Uh, Chiron is a very experienced player, very good at quick chess, bullet chess. He's got a really high bullet rating, uh, about 800 points higher than I could have probably hoped <laughs> to attain. Um, but anyway, he's a talented player. He's available for chess lessons. I recommend him, give him a try. Uh, he's willing to share his knowledge with you and help you get better at chess. So let's let's take a quick look at this opening here. It looks like the Scandinavian defense. And knight f6 is a good move. Uh, white can get in a lot of trouble early, for instance, if white plays c4, tries to hold on to the pawn. And trust me on that, I'll leave you to look up. Every time they move, it upsets my board, but that's okay. Uh, now, uh, white uh, or black retakes his pawn. And probably the best method for white to do is just develop pieces. Uh, there's nothing wrong with kicking the knight, but let's look at what it does. First off, it, it lessens, it decreases the scope of this bishop just ever so slightly, okay? Uh, the pipe, the idea is black wants white to advance his pawns so that they can become targets later, hypermodern style. He's going to maybe attack these pawns from, uh, maybe from the flank, maybe, we'll see. Uh, or uh, try for a, uh, a potential break uh, at the at that uh, advanced uh, pawn center of whites. Okay, we don't know. It depends on on the uh, line. Now, are you if you play this line, you need or if you're an e4 player, you need to be prepared against it, and that's where a good chess library comes in. Uh, I've been finding more and more people aren't reading chess books or using databases, particularly in correspondence chess. You know, this, all this information is out there. You need to need to learn about it. And and we, the masters, we've been around a while. We know this, these things. We're, we're here to teach you. Okay, so now this is a logical move by black to pin uh, to pin the knight, okay? Uh, it's not going to win uh, uh, black anything, but let's take a look at what it's threatening. Okay, for instance, if, if, uh, if, it, was, if it was black's move, and it isn't, uh, you make an exchange on f3, and maybe you can pick up this pawn. Although there's there's a shot down here, so you got to be careful. But at the same time, you know, if if this bishop comes here uh, and avoids the double pawns, then this this pawn could be loose. Well, you got to take care of business here first. But at first off, it's not Black's move, and and second, uh, uh, Black has Black will have a chance to try to. Uh, uh, improve his position so that maybe these threats can come in. And I don't really know the theory on this because I don't play the, uh, this line as white or black. Uh, now this, to me, seems to be... Let's go back. Every time they move, it upsets the apple cart. Uh, Okay, so I just had to pause there. Are you on his friends list? Okay. All right. Well, anyway, I want to try to comment on this game a little bit. Okay, so if you guys, you know, we, we offer these simuls, but you have to get on someone's friend list if you want to play in a simul, okay? Because uh, it, the neat thing about chess.com is anybody that's on their friends list, their name shows up and for your easy convenience. And uh, if you're not on a friends list, good luck. I mean, I'm not going to go through the detail. I can't show it on this video capture screen, uh, but... but uh, you're going to have to go through pages and pages and pages of people with the letter K just to find him. Or in your case, we have Conrad123. He would have to go through pages and pages to find you. And, uh, oh, good. That guy got a game. Okay, good. Okay, so we got more than one game to cover. And hopefully more hopefully more will uh, be playing. Uh, we don't want to just cover one game, but we'll cover the games that we get. L let me try to comment a little more on this game here. 
Uh, I thought C5 was premature. Now, why is why is why is this premature? Well, here's here's the reason right here. The square D5. That was a square that uh, uh, White under, had under control. The black. Uh, eh, Goody, start more games. Okay, we'll come back to this one. Uh, let me find it. Which one was it? This one? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's not your fault, Chiron. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's Chiron? Chiron? I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, I'm trying to find the game I'm commenting on. It'll get easier as he gets more games going. Let's see. Where's, where's the game I wanted? Oh, wait, here it is. He's got four games going. Good. Yay. Okay. Go back to this game. D5 now is the square that black can occupy. Can white ever drive uh, that knight away with a pawn? The answer is no. Uh, black now has an outpost. So uh, this bodes well for uh, for black for the long run because this is an, uh, now a strong point that he can keep a, a piece at. And anytime white makes an exchange, black will replace it most likely with another piece. Ideally, black would like to get... And not this knight over to f6 to back it up. So let's see what happens. Now uh, white develops his queen, uh, counterattacking uh, b7. And there's two possible candidate moves. Uh, well, one, well, one's just horrible. It's a candidate move. Queen, queen c8. That hangs your knight. Okay. It's okay to analyze blunders. Okay. Uh, and what he, what Garan does is he he retreats his bishop to c8. And you know you might at first glance think that that uh, white has gained something here, but in reality, white really hasn't uh, because uh, that outpost on d5 remains. Uh, and now uh, white goes and comes up with a unique move. He pin, he's pinning this pawn. So it does have an interesting result here. We're going to get a really an interesting imbalance here. He kicks the, kicks the bishop out and plays g5. Now, normally, I don't recommend strategies like this. Uh, early in the game is if you're playing uh, black here. Why? Because you just weaken your king side. But it does make for a pretty entertaining imbalance that's, that could come here. Uh, they moved. Okay, let's catch up. Okay, so g5. Uh, bishop c4. So both sides are accepting some pawn weakness and he anchors the knight in with c6. Now, uh, Black doesn't mind bishop takes d5 because this will give him the bishop pair. Now, back to this imbalance I'm talking about. Urgh. Every time they move, they refresh my screen. It's not your fault. Uh, don't. Okay, white's playing a little too quick. Let, I'm going to make a comment about the time in just a moment. Uh, let's try to get this game up to date. Then I can go on and look at some others and we'll come back. Okay, another thing about this idea is this bishop's going to fianchetto, and that puts more pressure on d4. Now, would you rather have your pieces attacking squares and, and weak pawns, or would you have them have them defending them? Well, I think the answer is obvious. You'd rather have them attacking them. And here comes bishop g7. And now comes an interesting move, h4. So at this point, uh, white's kind of throwing caution to the wind. Uh, he wants to attack. But does he have enough... Uh, oomph here in his position to attack the black king. Uh, he moved. Urgh. Okay. Well, I, I don't recommend b trying to break a position open too quickly when you don't have all your pieces developed. See, right now, this knight is uh, still on b1. The white king is in the center. He's vulnerable there. Uh, you might be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if this king loses casting privileges. Uh, at the same time, where's the black king going to go? He's got to get castle too. The entire white queen or black queen side is undeveloped. This bishop hasn't come out uh, yet. Well, it did, but it, it went back. But that was something uh, uh, black was willing to do. But I like his answer here, g4. This just uh, seals up the king side. And even though it does take a, a g5 square from a bishop, it does seal up the king side. And... and uh, now black just continues his development. Now here's a trick: is is he hanging a pawn? That's a good question. Bishop takes, pawn takes, queen takes. Uh, maybe he is. Maybe he's just dropped a pawn here. Uh, if on bishop takes, knight takes e5. You have bishop takes f7 check. Uh, the knight comes back and takes the bishop. No, that's not going to. Uh, that's not going to work for white. Let's see. We 
he's taking white is taking a knight black is taking a knight and a bishop no that's not going to work oh there so he did a little different order now is white's definitely going for broke here he's he's going to displace the uh black king and uh open up some lines for his queen to start checking however i don't think white has enough development here so this is a pretty interesting game Let, let's kind of look around a little bit and and uh I'll try to comment on time control. Okay, they're playing a time control of 25 and 5. What does this mean? Okay, that means you have 25 minutes for the game, and every time you move, you get a 5-second increment. So this is a good time control because uh, you will uh, you have enough time to uh, play a reasonable amount of moves and, and have a 5-second increment. And someone's Skyping me. Who's Skyping me? Uh... Um, okay anyway let's get back to what i was saying 25 and 5 now let's just get get something out of the way if you haven't heard me say blabber this on videos before e time what we talk talk about e time what does a 25 and 5 mean well the formula is you take the minutes and two-thirds the increment Two-thirds of five is is uh, is what? Uh, uh, three minutes, roughly. Three minutes and so, so many seconds. Uh, you basically, you have about a 28-minute game. Now, they base this on the average game lasting about uh, 40 moves. If you were to go to visit an over-the-board tournament, uh, where they all start the game rounds on the same time with the same time control. And if you look at the time control and see, like if they say they're playing 40 moves in two hours, they say the round starts at 11 o'clock. If you were to come back at 3 o'clock, uh, you would find about half the games, maybe a little bit more, were over. Uh, and then the ones that are left, these uh, these will usually start winding up pretty quick. Uh, and if, in effect, by move 40, you, have an, you, you should have an idea who's going to win. Uh, if it doesn't in a, in a victory or defeat or an early draw uh, first, okay? But by move 40, by for most indications, the result is probably going to be known. And there's naturally there will be a number of games that are still in the ending where maybe one side has a slight advantage and has to work for it or totally equal, and one side's just trying not to trying anything he can not to take, not to get a draw. And some of these games will go on a little longer, but that's okay. So what does this mean to you? Okay, you have, if you're playing 25-5, 20, let's do some math. 25 times 60, that's how many seconds are in a minute. What's that give you? 1,500 seconds. Now, if you were to take 1,500 seconds and divide by 40, you have close to 40 seconds a move. Not quite, but close. Now, if you want to save a couple of minutes, just in case, you could say... Uh, 40, uh, uh, 1,200, 1200, let's just go 1,200. 1,200 minutes, or 1,200 seconds divided by 40 moves gives you 30 seconds a move. And then you'll still have three minutes every move plus a five second, or left at move 40 plus a five second increment. So you kind of want to pace yourself a little bit in, in that regard. Uh, now the simul giver, the more games he has, the harder it is for him to uh, get back to the boards. He's going to have to play a quick time control. But here we have move 12, move 12, and at move 20, uh, if you're playing black here, you should have about uh, 10 minutes left. So he's used five minutes on his clock. He's, it looks like black is going a little too quick, but often that can be forgiven in the opening because you can hash out uh, a number of book moves. Okay, let's get to this game and see what we see. Okay, we have, uh, no, didn't go into him as a Indian, went into Queen's Gambit, Lasker Defense, and that's kind of like a Tartakower line. Usually, though, the Tartakower, uh, whoops, I'm going to back up. The Tartakower line involves uh, taking back with the pawn. You put the bishop here and eventually play c5, and you're willing to accept hanging pawns, which can be very strong. Uh, one game I always like to talk about is... Uh, uh, Korsnoy versus Karpov, first World Championship match game, 1981. They called it the Massacre in Murano. Uh, Korsnoy uh, allowed Karpov to get the hanging pawns, and, and Karpov wouldn't buckle. And he just steadily built up, uh, started improving his position. And, and finally, there was what we call a tactical uh, a push of these pawns. And uh, one of them advanced, 
And that opened up the line lines for Karpov's pieces, and Korsnoy and got blown off the board. Okay, uh, so I kind of went a little too far here, but but by taking on d5 with the knight, uh, Black saying I'm going to have a long diagonal for my bishop. But in doing so, uh, you also you take away the dynamics of the of the hanging pawns and give White a chance to maybe build a pawn center later. Uh, let's have a look and see how it it turns out. He takes back with the knight. Uh, now I don't think this knight is is well placed on e7. Uh, but then what are the alternatives? If you take with the queen, uh, knight takes, pawn takes. Now black can still go back for the hanging pawns, but there's a couple minor pieces off, and the hanging pawns are better when there are more pieces on. As, as more pieces disappear, uh, the, the hanging pawns become weaker. Did I clarify what hanging pawns are? Uh, okay, if queen takes, knight takes, pawn takes, uh, white will develop something. Black will play c5, and <laughs> thank you for destroying my uh, diagram, my arrows. Okay, <laughs> no, it's not your fault. Okay, let's see, c5. No, not yet. Where was it? Here? No. Here? Trying to find where I, where I try to explain the hanging pawns. Okay. Bishop takes, queen takes, knight takes, pawn takes, bishop e7, c5, pawn takes, pawn takes. Now, these pawn, black pawns on d5 and c5 are what we call the hanging pawns. They can't be protected by another pawn. If either one advances, it creates a, 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 a potential weakness, an outpost uh, on to the square it left control of, okay? But, you know, that again, the, you can, one of the ideas of taking the hanging pawns is to get that tactical push in, as I'm in that aforementioned Korchnoi Karpov World Championship game. So he took with the knight. I think the knight's a little misplaced here. And white just develops. Now white's got three pieces out, black has two, but black's castled. So we could say that uh, for tempo-wise, the game is about even. Uh, and white picks up a tempo here, attacks... Uh, attacks a pawn and forces black to make a decision. And I think the best move was probably just my first instinct is always move your pieces, not your pawns. Playing h6 creates a weakness. It's not much of one, but it is a weakness. Now knight f6 uh, contests uh, or improves the position of the knight. Black needed a knight on that square. Uh, white could then perhaps play e4 and get ready to push. Uh, and then but keeping the dial on d7 supports a c5 break. So it looks like h6 is the kind of kind of move that if you're a super grandmaster like Gadakomsky, you can look here and 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 explain in in 30 seconds exactly what White's winning plan is, and and he'll demonstrate it every time. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not Gadakomsky, and neither is are are White and Black in this game. So anyway, White just makes logical moves, continues his development, and now uh, white is threatening to uh, isolate a pawn on black c5, if not win it. Let's see, pawn takes, knight takes, knight takes, pawn takes, queen takes. Does black have any useful counterattacks? Well, he could double up uh, some pawns over here, but I think he's just going to be playing a pawn down. So black relinquishes this, uh, and now we have an, we're going to have a balanced pawn structure, very symmetrical. Uh, but one drawback with making this move even though it clears c5 for a knight, which might be a good move to play at some point after a timely rook c8, it's improving the position of this white knight. Uh, suddenly this knight has access to squares he didn't have before, like particularly b5, or possibly a sacrifice at some point on e6. Uh, this is one of the things about creating these, uh, creating these weaknesses I was talking about with h6. It does weaken g6 a little bit, and if you need to occupy g6 in a hurry, uh, what better way than to eliminate e6? Now, how can that come into play? Well, very easily. Uh, suppose this knight went to g6. What's guarding it? This this uh, pawn. Okay. Do a sack on e6. The pawn takes, and, and the knight on g6 falls. See, h6 does weaken. Okay. So uh, I'm going to check another game out. I want to try to cover each and every one of these and get caught up on them. And no, oh, going to move and. Take me out of the, take me out of what I was doing. Okay, so we have the English opening, symmetrical variation. Uh, e3 is an e interesting plan. I prefer knight f3 myself, but e3 certainly is strategically good. Now, black can't afford to play symmetrically forever. Eventually, there will come a move that black cannot duplicate. So, uh, 
although you could say he has arguably a very even game here and and here it comes and now here we have a case of the uh, isolated queen pawn coming uh, white is going to accept an isolated queen pawn by this after d5 and good we are breaking symmetry and here it is white's pawn on d4 is isolated it can't be protected by another pawn but in, in compensation <laughs> thank you in compensation for it uh, let's see where were we in compensation for it uh, uh, white has a uh, freedom for his pieces now usually e5 is is a is a good square that white likes to put a knight on uh, but it's right now that's kind of hard to do uh, this knight is going to have to do a little remaneuvering and that's going to take some time so I find his reply here very interesting uh, he plays bishop e3. He's willing to give up the bishop pair, take uh, take a, a couple of hanging pawns himself, uh, a potential weak pawn on e6, and hope that his knights uh, can can do him right. Now, one drawback for black is this bishop right here. See, where, where's it going? It doesn't really have any activity. So white... <laughs> uh, black goes ahead and bites and takes on e3 and for what it's worth white has three pawn islands black has four uh, theoretically uh, hmm, uh, theoretically uh, black is better on pawn structure based on the that fact that white has next to pawn island black theoretically could be better because of his bishop pair and these knights don't have uh, uh, really terrific outposts yet although you know it's hard to see how he's going to improve the position of him. so looks like the game is even and uh, black endeavors I think this is a good move he endeavors to uh, leave white with one bad pawn but there's there comes a drawback to the strategies we will see uh, white doesn't have to take okay I can admire black for wanting to activate this bishop but but uh, er, uh, well, fully by the time I get caught up on all the games, uh, this won't be happening. Okay, d5. This is this is the flying element. Now white has a a protected. Uh, well, wouldn't say protected. White has a pass pawn. It's protected by pieces. It's not protected by pawns. An ideal protected pawn would be where you had a pawn chain like this. Although black could still take pot shots at it, but we're not in that kind of position. This forces the black knight to retreat. Queen comes out, restricting the bishop's development. Uh, and I think black makes an interesting move here he attacks the uh, weakness on e3 white doesn't have a dark squared bishop and now an interesting move would be queen b6 check and we kind of have what, what I like to call a Mexican standoff who's going to trade queens whoever trades queens gives the other side a double pawn but an open file a half open file uh, those are always interesting positions. Uh, they come up a lot in in queen pawn openings, Slav defenses, things like that. Uh, it would have been an interesting move. Instead, he put his queen on d6, and that's interesting. Uh, it's played to restrict the uh, uh, the black bishop. It, it just doesn't have a square, uh, but at the same time, it's uh, it's in it's possibly creating uh, weaknesses in in the white king's king position. So how do you how do you take advantage of something like this if you're black? Well, maybe break, try to blast the center open. Uh, maybe if you're worried about this pawn, if you're not worried about the pawn, just put the bishop here. Okay, at least it's developed. Your rooks are connected. If you're worried about the pawn, push it. Although that weakens c6, and but then the bishop can maybe come to a6 with a pin. Um, he doesn't go in for that. He played a6. I guess he's planning b5. Now, now comes f5. That's the move I was wanting. Did I mention it? You know, but I was saying get the bishop developed before you break things open. Uh, so it's a it's a pretty tough game here. I think uh, you know the master's going to have to work to get his point here. You know, we're assuming the master's going to win every game. Uh, in practice, <laughs> it don't happen. I think I managed in all the samples I given. I think I managed one whitewash, and I was headed for another one and walked into a mate that I'd even talked about on the video. I've got to make sure I don't allow this mate. And like four moves later, there it was.
Go to my history. It's in there, the last game I lost in standard chess. Pretty funny. Anyway, uh, let's uh, take a second here. I'm going to advertise in the group or the, the, in the notes here for people that are watching that, that I have a group that gives lessons and that there's a video uh, being made of this. I need to do this in every game, and I'll do it now, and I'll do it later. Okay, let's see. We've Doom Grace is updated a little bit. I'm going to come back to that because there's games I haven't even started yet. Uh, this one I'd covered. Um, this one I've covered. Let's see what's left. Is he only playing four games? Maybe he's only playing four games. Well, I don't know. We'll find out here. Okay, uh, Sicilian Defense, Accelerated Fianchetto. Uh, black should be fine. Interesting move. Now, once again, the isolated queen pawn comes into play. Okay. Uh, but I don't think this is white's best. Why? Why Why do I say that? You know, you look at that and say, well, it looks like a good move. It uh, it blunts this bishop. <laughs> don't move. <laughs> it's not your fault. Okay. I'm trying to make a useful thing so you guys can learn some opening. Oh, he's going to move again. Maybe I've... I'll just take a peek and see. Oh, look, it's only a four-board simul. Okay, so which game were we at? Um, eh, he keeps moving. Uh, looks like White's taking his time here. There's 12 minutes on his clock, so he's doing a good job. He's used half his time. Okay, but what, I'm trying to say, trying to identify why D4 is not a or E5 is not a good move. Okay. If you do take an isolated queen pawn, you have a lot of free play behind your pieces. Like, for instance, eh, no, I think I did that, not him. Okay. I'm trying to, okay. If pawn takes, now he can, he could also play the knight here, but I'm just saying if queen takes, well, pawn takes, queen takes, knight takes, queen a5. Uh, White's got some free development here, okay? Okay. Uh, his bishops have open diagonals. His queen has room to breathe. And he'll be castle quickly and the rooks will come into play. And uh, But when you push e5, you're closing the center up. And now, this bishop is, even though you've blended this bishop, this bishop isn't, particularly, isn't a particularly good piece. And also... Look at this square. I mean, we always talk about squares. Every time you advance a pawn, you weaken a square. Even when you play, you know, let's go back to the beginning. Even when you play e4, look, white just weakened four squares. Did you know that? Did you ever think about that? Well, it doesn't really matter in this position. We know that, but it could be a problem. I mean, it, some variations, white plays like the Botvinnik pawn formation. Oh, look, hello, d4 for black. Okay. If you push this g pawn at some point, you're going to weaken this f3. And it could be really embarrassing if, if, uh, if you have a knight on f3 and and you run into a triple attack on that piece, yeah, you know. So every time you move a pawn, you weaken a square. But in but we have we have the bases covered earlier. But as they as we go up uh, further into the game, the farther the far uh, the the more they advance, the weaker they become. So suddenly black has f5. There's all kinds of ways to occupy that square. You can play h5, uh, knight h6, knight f5, put the bishop on f5. Uh, all kinds of things. I don't know how it's going to turn out yet because I keep getting, uh, they keep making moves and bringing them up to date. Anyway, knight c6 is good too. Now this does attack. This is a weak pawn. C can it be guarded by a pawn? No. Is it isolated? No. Is it backward? Uh, that's a good question. It's not back. It's not an open file, but it's not, uh, it's, it, if, if attacked, it must be defended by a piece. And right now, white's got two pieces Guarding it or overprotecting it, as Nimzovich would say. Okay, bishop g5, pinning the e pawn. Now he didn't pick f5 for a square, but it hasn't gone away. He's got a pin. Now there's there's might be some tactical threats. Okay, h3, and he takes, and now he wins wins the pawn. So uh, strategically, unless White can drum up something here pretty quick, uh, Black is close to having a winning position. Already. Uh oh, there goes another pawn. And oh, I, I don't understand that. It might be a mouse slip. King e. What's he doing with king d1? Now the king can't castle. He can't castle queenside. 
unless there, unless there's some kind of a touch move thing in live chess where if you touch it you have to move it see the king can't move here and he can't castle so I don't know king d1 is a mystery uh, but black is two pawns up and just needs to uh, complete his development and he'll do fine uh oh look at that let's see king d1 queen c7 here comes a nasty check that'll get the queens off and well let's see got to take with the knight does that knight run into a pin oh no he have knight e3 as an exit check i'm looking at rook c1 black is just two pawns up and and white's uh killing him okay we haven't talked about the doom grace game in a while can i remember what happened in this game let's see uh it was this was the one where the d5 square eh, don't move Maybe when they get version three, this this won't happen. Sure, make my make live commentary videos a lot easier. Okay. Oh yeah, he sacked the knight. He's going for broke here. So it could be some very interesting chess. Uh, there's an interesting book called uh, Chess for Tigers. Who wrote it? Simon Webb. I think he's an English grandmaster. Uh, there's been several editions of it. It's it's a it's a cult classic. Pick it up. You'll have fun with it. But he's got a a chapter on what to do against when you play a strong player. I think it calls it trapping a heffalump or something like that. There's one about uh, chasing rabbits where you're playing a weaker player and going for the heffalump was the big creature. And uh, one way they say if you just play your normal game, he's going to grind you down. So why not go for broke and throw everything but the kitchen sink against him? And he gives an example where I think uh, Arabic master defeated uh, five-time U.S. champion Walter Brown. Uh, it's been years since I looked at it. I have it on my bookshelf, but it's a it's a fun book. Uh, you learn a lot about chess with that book. I highly recommend it. Okay, so here comes the sacrifice. Now, what does he get? We haven't even looked at that yet. Okay, so the king comes back to f8, uh, but white needs some development here. And I was talking earlier about how maybe that white king will never get castled. Uh, now black's trying to work his way out and convert his material advantage. There he gets castled. Uh, potential problems, uh, counter counterplay for black, uh, but black's got to get these guys in the game too. Okay, that white's given up a piece, uh, but uh, 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 white black is behind in development. So knight f6, interesting rook move. What's he doing? Protecting the the well, the bishop was already protected. Uh, I like to see moves like this. These are kind of fun. Like what did why? Whoop! Lost my screen. Why would Black play Rook H7? You know, when you see moves like this, you just as you know, we're giving him credit. He's he's a strong master. We're giving him credit. It's got to be a good move, okay? Uh, I just like to try to figure out why he would do it. Would I play it? Well, maybe if I spent. Uh, 20 minutes on the position, I might realize why it's a good move. Can I find out why it's a good move in in 15 seconds without boring it to death? Uh, okay, one I well the rook isn't doing him much good on on H. <laughs> Stop moving pieces. Arr. Okay, no, it's not your fault. I've said that a hundred times. Okay, the rook isn't doing much on H8. Maybe he's trying to get it to F7, going through a maneuver like this. Uh, let's see. Where can this bishop develop? Well, it could go to it could go there to d7. Then where does it go? If it goes to c6, d5 comes in. He's a little tied up here on the uh, queen side. White has some compensation, but I think in the long run he's going to get ground down here. Okay, so I can't figure out exactly why he did it. Let, let's see this follow up. Knight h5. Ah. Ah, well, let's see, he probably wanted, was he trying to avoid a check? No, the bishop was always guarded, was already guarded by the king. Still can't figure out why he played uh, rook h7. Now maybe queen e4 attacking that rook on h7. Uh, and that's what he does. And he takes. So the rook is bait. That's what it is. Come down and take it and go no further. <laughs> 
Yeah, he, why can take this rook? Then where's the, where's the queen go next? Uh, it's uh, its trip is over, and let's see. White black will play something like queen here, with the idea of developing the bishop. So there's we found the purpose of rook h7. But I suspect I'm going to give him credit. I suspect there were far more uh, subtle reasons why he did it. Uh, than I've uncovered. Okay, so now there's a direct line uh, at the black king. So here's another reason for rook h7. Black is planning to march his king to h8 where he's safe. Okay, so there we found another reason why rook h7. Very interesting move. Okay, uh, this is good. It clears, it clears the path for the knight. This pawn is pinned, but it also gives up pressure on c6. And maybe this bishop can get into play now. Uh, white gets this monster pawn on the seventh rank, and sometimes these pawns can get—they uh, can just be a, a plain nuisance. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard of Fide Master N Fork. He plays here at Chess.com. He's given simuls. He's active on ICC. Finland, uh, very talented player in his early 30s, late 20s, early 30s, and and uh, we collaborated on. Uh, on game analysis for the ICC Team 45 45 League website, he provided uh, written commentary, and I provided uh, my own independent video analysis. Then, then I took a look at what he had to say, and 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 I shared what he said. And sometimes we we were both in agreement. Sometimes we caught stuff the other one saw, the other would, and the other didn't. But he, he was talking about these pawns going down to the seventh rank, and they can just be very very strong. And here, without updating the position just look how strong that pawn is how does how does black get rid of it uh white's got a good position here okay so let's update this find out where we left off d6 and then we'll move on to another game okay and see king h8 that was the whole purpose of rook h7 my king is headed there okay Good, good, good plan. Now, was that knight? Did he, did he need to eliminate that knight? This just looks like such a useful bishop. I'm not saying it's a bad move. I always have a first impression of a position. Doesn't mean my first impression is good. If it was, I'd be uh, uh, undefeated as Blitz King, right? Okay, but the first impression of this position is that uh, that's a great piece. Black has two bishops. Why not use them? Where is that knight threatening to go? Is it threatening to go to f6? Ye could be. There's a fork, and then the white, the black king becomes kind of exposed. But that pawn could get dangerous. Okay, so we took it. Anchors in the pawn on g4. There's the rook on the seventh. Now we chase the queen out. Now he's trying, going to try and work on that pawn. Uh, very interesting game. Let's see. I need to do a little promotion here. Let's see. Uh, I got a message to post in every game here. Let me get it posted. You now, you guys need to join my group. It's it's exciting. I mean, all the things we're doing in there. Uh, my free videos. I got a lot of talent masters coming aboard to help give simuls. I've been giving them when I can. And I give longer ones because I'm a slow thinker. And then I like to do live commentary of my own games and explain what I'm thinking. I don't care if I lose the games. I want you guys to have experience. Oh, look at that. We have pressure on D8. Uh, wow. Okay. So we'll come back to this one. Let's see. Did... Is this game over? No, it's still going. Okay. Um... Looks like maybe black's a little better here. I was thinking white was better in this earlier. What's gone wrong? Uh, let me uh, post my messages in the chat because we want the spectators to join the group and have fun and get better at chess, meet these players, and have a grand old time. Okay, so there we go. That's posted. And... I have to remind myself to do this later in the simul. 
Okay. So it looks like somehow Black's gotten the upper hand here. Uh, only because I I think his knight's good. I didn't really get a chance to evaluate it. And White has some double pawns. So here's talk about how the White Knights are in play. But I also mentioned the game is symmetrical. And Black is getting ready to uh, uh, activate his pieces. So White preserves his bishop. And yeah, it looks pretty even to me. Uh, Black has played this played this well, and you know the more pieces that come off, the more even it becomes. Uh, now there's pressure on. Yeah, thanks for destroying my position. Let's see where was it? Queen A8 was the last move. Uh, well, I'm just gonna have to find it. Time-wise, Karan is down to six minutes, so he's gonna have to accelerate things a little bit. Okay, queen a8, f3, that's where the double pawns are going to hit. So, my, my feeling is that this position is better for uh, black because of the double pawns. And this knight, look at that knight. How does, how does white evict that knight? The answer is, he doesn't. Oh, we had a game result. I'll look at that here in a minute or two. Uh, There's your path to evict it, <laughs> and then watch out f6, and it's and it's in for the duration. So rook d2 to stop the rook penetration, and I would say the game looks pretty even. Uh, now, if you, if White trades rooks, he can try to win. Uh, there's a famous game I like to quote. If you're a member of ICC, I think it's game 151 or 159 in my library. It's Stoltz versus the Cash Den, Hague, 1928. Where's Cash Den, former, uh, one of the, probably, it, it definitely in the top five players in the world in the late 1920s, behind Ayekin and Capablanca. Uh, you, you know, there's always an argument in there, but this is before Bofidic and Carries came into prominence. Uh, he was definitely up there and, and considered a candidate for the world championship. Uh, he proved in that game in the Olympics in the Hague 1928 how the bishop beats the knight in the ending but uh, cash then didn't have a, a weak double pawn so what we'll do is we'll we, let's go to the game that ended uh, actually let's come back to the one that ended uh, and let me get my post in here this is the one I think he dropped two pawns. Uh, okay, so for the spectators to join my group. And we will continue with what's going on here. See, Black, Black won two pawns. The other game ended. Was it this one? Uh... Okay, let's go back. Uh, okay, well. Okay, let's see. This might be the only game left. I think he only played four games. Okay, so that's when he misplaced the king. And the queens came off. Now, I was talking about pinning the knight with rook c1. He, don't, he doesn't. He guards the pawn on b2. But there's the exit check black had. And there's that f5 square. So I'm talking about in this game or another game. I think it was, I think it was another game. Uh, now black can't castle. How interesting. Uh, this game is still going on at this point. Uh, but black is down two pawns. Okay. Let's see what we had. This game ended. Uh, I was talking about that rook getting strong, the white, that pawn being strong, and I guess it, it did it. Uh, now this rook d8 is a serious threat. And, oh, this just unfortunately dropped a pawn. Yeah, he, he missed... Uh, he missed the... Whoops, get away. From, okay, he missed this. He un unprotected his own pawn. Uh... Let's see. So let's look at the outcome and try to see what's happening. And now he promoted to a knight with check under promotion. Very clever. The point being the uh, 
uh, the queen is pinned and can't take. Therefore, white wins. So, did was white winning this? I was talking about this game was suddenly becoming very dangerous. Uh, maybe what... Can black give back the piece? Let's see. Can he take this pawn? This looks awful dangerous. Uh, but might be the only choice. Let's see. If any... Well, let's see. On a check... This looks... This... Wait. Wait, 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 wait. This didn't, this didn't give back the piece. Uh, let's see. Bishop takes... Bishop takes e7. If rook takes e7, black's going to be up a rook. Can, can he get away with this move? Uh, what am I missing? Probably something blatantly obvious. Let's see. Rook d8 is not going to work. Bishop takes. This check is met. This check, we'll try this check instead of e5. Uh, bishop f6, going to get away with that. Now h7 is covered. Like if black tries to get on that. I don't know. What am I missing? I'm probably missing something. Oh, what's this popping up? What is? What are you doing here? Where did this come from? Cover. <laughs> Developer tools at livechess.com. Hey, look at this. What does this do? I have no clue. Go away. <laughs> okay. I don't know how that came up. I hit something. Okay. What what am I missing? Can he can he just get away with bishop takes e seven instead of rook takes e six? Uh let's see. Well there's a pin. Maybe that's what I'm missing. It takes me a while to find these things. Okay, now come here. Now we no longer guard f6. So this check may become very troublesome. Let's just let's just take this out. Uh, and not saying it's the white doesn't have better, but white has a minimum of this. Okay, and we'll move on. White has a minimum of this, and I think strategically. Uh, White's close to winning this. Uh, this black rook isn't in the game yet. I suppose it can come here. But uh, who would you rather play here, white or black? Well, good game for Doom Grace. Uh, let's see which game is still going. This one is still going. I think there's two games going. How many play? Four or five? I don't know. Uh, he lost this game. How did that happen? Uh... Did I cover this one at all? Oh, he's a symmetrical English. And I was saying, yeah, okay. The, the isolated pawn. Yeah, I thought... Yeah, bish, yeah. You are talking about queen b6. And the, the, the drawback I was saying for white was that he was creating weaknesses in his king side, and, and who knows what happens when black blasts the position open. And I guess we're about to get our answer here. Should... Black or white have taken that. I don't think so. Uh, unless you're afraid of f4. Uh, but then you play g4 and you both get protected pass pawn and you call it an even game. You redeploy this knight to blockade. Maybe. But this develops the black pieces. Although he didn't take back with a piece. That's my first impression. Why not take with a bishop? Why not take with the knight? Get that knight in play. What do I know? Okay. But... Now, ooh, wow. G4 is bold. Uh, but then again, you know, you know, why is white weak against position? E4 could come in. You don't have time for knight here. I'm like a black more and more here. I can see how he... B4 didn't quite expect... I don't quite expect this unless he's trying to get this knight away from 
from somewhere. And that got it off the side of the board. That's something. That's nowhere's nowhere land. Okay, now he wants the G file open. Now there's a pin. Breaks the pin. Develops the bishop. Now the queen is overloaded here. See, it's guarding two pieces. These are the kind of things that come with experience. I can often see, sometimes I don't see tactics for 30 seconds or a minute. Sometimes I see them right away. Why, why do I see something like this right away? Well, it's because in the back of my mind, I didn't mention it. I, when, when he played king h1, I, you know, first thing I see is the king's guarding the knight. And, 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 and in my thinking, I say, when every time you move a piece, you unprotect a square. I talked about pawns earlier in the video. Well, you're in predicting g3. What's guarding g3? Ah, the queen is guarding it. So I know in the back of my mind this queen is already guarding it. But now when he attacks this this bishop, I mean, this bishop goes to d7 and attacks the knight on a4, I know that the queen is now overloaded. Something has to give in if, if, uh, if white's not careful. Like, for instance, if white plays a3, uh, just burning a move, black takes his pick. Which knight does he want to take? And after he takes one and white takes back, if white, assuming white does take back, can't find a great solution of his own, black wins a piece. So white deals with it by taking this pawn, but that's just opening up his king. You know, this king position is getting really opened up here. Uh, this passed pawn is not as strong as it once looked. Uh... And I was talking about a3 burning a move. There it comes anyway on its own. Now all the black pieces are coming into play. The bishops are pointing pointing at the king. They call these Harwitz bishops or something similar to that. Does white have time to grab a pawn? But how does he defend his position? Rook f3, rook f2. And one of these moves. But these bishops are strong. They're just going to take squares away from those rooks. Here comes a, a doubling and a tripling. And now the g3 square, which was weakened by h3, comes into play. And then there's a sacrifice. And looks like mate. Uh, there's one way to get a check. And that does it. Well, good game by Skakista Supremo. Uh, so let me close some of these games that are over. Uh, that way I can negotiate easier with the games that are still underway. Okay, now i got to find the games. I guess he only played four games and he lost two. Mercy. He's got to win two just to get even. Uh, okay, so this one ended. Let me close Doom Grace. And now it's just to a quick look. Oh, we did end up with a bishop versus knight ending. White Black has some weaknesses in his uh, kingside pawns. And this is the one that White's just up, or black's just up two pawns. I always mix black and white up. <laughs> I call white black and black white. I've been doing it since day one of making these videos. It really gets bad when I get tired and, and I start uh, misnaming squares, talking about which square to go to. I'll, I'll, I'll call this square G2. Well, it is G2 if you're playing white. <laughs> but then it really gets confusing when I call it... Uh, uh, c7 or maybe i'm i might call it b5 now why would i call that b5 well because i'm thinking uh, in the back of my mind i'm already thinking about putting that pawn on b5 so anyway uh this one's just a cakewalk i think uh up two pawns let's see uh two minor pieces each and two rooks each now the knight's anchored in and a third pawn ahead. Now some pressure on b5, but he just uh, took me out of that. Let's see. Bishop comes back now. Oh, okay, this one. Won this game ended. Uh, so I'll be able to uh, focus on the last game. So let's see. Here he played knight c4. Four. Now, does he have time to take this? No, because there's a check. And now 
he walked, stepped out of one fork and into another one. Oops. Well, he uh, White White was going to lose this. But anyway, I uh, hope the video analysis of this helped. Let's close this one down and go to Conrad because we're down to one game. And here it is. And I was talking earlier when I saw this briefly. I said uh, Black had some pawn weaknesses on the king side. Well, he doesn't anymore. But there are all kinds of entry points over there if White can penetrate. So my gut instinct is a draw here only because White has a double pawns. Let's see. This is about where we left off. So entry points. What are entry points? Entry points are a place where your king can get in. Now, black can't go in with this king. Uh, those squares are covered by the bishop. This square is covered by a pawn. This square is covered by a pawn. And if you can't get to a4, I mean, if you can't get to b5, you can't get to a4, right? Oops, went back too far. Yeah. So we're talking entry points for black, and we'll talk about entry points for white. So we can give you a little education on, on the end games. Okay, so uh, does white have entry points? Well, this knight's taking c4 away. This pawn is taking b4 away. There's an entry point on a4. But where do you go next? How do you get in next? And if you give that entry point up, do you maybe let this knight come into play? So, king side. Uh, let's trace a path for the king. Does this king have entry points? Uh, now you can get to e5. And, you know, it's interesting. That one of the... Maybe e5... <laughs> e5 might be the ideal square for the black king to play for a win. It's not because white has double pawns. Why do I say e5? Well, let me find the right position. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Let's back it up. Okay, why would e5 be the square? Well... When you, if you get in an ending where your knight is blockading an isolated pawn, you want to get that knight out of there because that now becomes a square for your king. In the opening and the middle game, your knight, your knight's supposed to blockade the isolated pawn. But once you reach the ending, that's a square for the king. Now, if this king were here, uh, he's threatening to make an entry point. And we know that white can't evict the knight from there, uh, right? So how can he evict the king from there? Well, there's only two draw. There's only two ways to evict that knight or that king. You have to create threats somewhere else on the board. Well, where are you going to do that? Well, on the king side. Oh, come on! Every time I want to get there, you move. Well, he's in time pressure. They're both in time pressure. It's going to be hard to keep up. I may have to. Let's see. The video is now 58 minutes. Maybe what I'll do is, even though the video, is, I, I, I like to take a walk every hour or so when I do it. I'll just blabber for a while, even though the position is going to change and there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, well, here, before the pawns get exchanged, I want this position here in particular. Okay. If the king was, if, if the black king was on e5, he's going to maintain a permanent threat on e4. That ties, that ties white down to defending that square, right? And now he's just moved and destroyed the position, so... Uh, I can't keep flicking the position back. It's it's just the chess.com interface, but I do want to kind of talk about things. So e5 is the square for the uh, the black king, because as we already showed, there's no entry points all anywhere else. Uh, White's got those squares covered. Then the knight can be redeployed uh, at, at in a timely fashion, where it can attack that pawn on e4. And how can White defend that pawn on e4? Well, king on d3. And a bishop on f3, or switch him. And that isn't all that particular healthy, uh, because white's tied up. If black has tempo moves at his disposal, uh, he can put uh, put white and Zugzwang, run white out of pawn moves, and 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 uh, and white has to uh, move his king or bishop, thus losing the pawn on e4. So if white loses that pawn on e4, his defensive task entirely changes. Now black will be able to uh, force a, uh, a, uh, a pass pawn with his central pawn majority and try to advance it and limit the squares of the white king and white bishop. 
and you know it becomes very theoretical uh, if you're going to be down a pawn in an ending the best ending to be down a pawn in is a rook and pawn ending and, and then you want your rook active uh, some bishop versus knight endings can be drawn for the uh, defending side with the, if you have the bishop but chances are if the if the opponent's king is active and his knight is good piece and you have no pawn weaknesses uh, the knight's going to the knight's going to rule okay and uh, but in in real play uh, where the clock is ticking and we have to uh, try to figure out a plan it's not always that easy and tactics can come up what kind of tactics come up well knight forks those come up like crazy and that naturally favors the side with the knight but the bishop is a long range piece uh, you can maybe find a timely pin a skewer uh, if there's a target on the other side of the board maybe a sacrifice to, to force a pawn breakthrough which would which might uh, deflect uh, the black king or queen or knight uh, over to, to, to stop it and he, he may very, may very well be able to stop it but that leaves the other side of the board open uh, where why could uh, maybe generate another pass pawn and create new threats so there's all kinds of possibilities uh, the best book on Bishop and Knight innings is part of what I call the Overbach series Grandmaster Yuri Overbach the Soviet Union uh, wrote or co-authored all but one of them uh, I they're originally published in Russian. I have the English translations. They're in English descriptive notation. Uh, Pergamon did a rewrite of them in the early 1980s in combined volumes. Those are in algebraic. But these are priceless uh, books. I'll, I'll give the eight in total. You have rook endings. You have pawn endings. You have queen endings. You have knight endings. You have bishop endings. Then you have bishop versus knight endings. You have rook versus minor piece endings. And you have queen versus either rook or minor piece ending. And what the Russians or Soviet Union tried to do uh, back in the days before computers and databases and table bases and all those things was construct a general rule for every conceivable type of ending when each side had a piece, or in some cases a piece versus pawns. They uh, and cover all the various positional aspects: a pawn up, a pawn down, positional advantage, uh, pawns, uh, bishop opposite colors, whatever. They tr they try they tried to. Uh, they try to cover every conceivable one so and come up with the general rule that you should follow and they uh, the, the works come from actual games played they come from studies that were created by uh, com uh, problem composers and they're fascinating fascinating book series uh, you can still track them down they're a little expensive I think pawn the pawn innings book sometimes is priced as high as 60 or 80 dollars but uh, but uh, but you're going to get a lot of knowledge out of these endings. And uh, back in the back in the days, you know, when I was a young, aspiring 1800 player, uh, I was well aware that our grandmasters that were going off to the interzonals sounded like a draw for and accepted. Uh, the grandmasters were going off to interzonals, and they would take uh, even the, the women's teams. They would take these books with them so that they would have reference to look at during adjournments. Because back in those days, before the uh, computers came along that could analyze a position for you, uh, you adjourned a game after a certain amount of play. You took a nap. Your second came came in into the scene, analyzed the game all night for you. Woke you up the next morning and said, "Hey, this is how you hold the win, or hold the draw rather, or, or get the win." So it looks like this game ended in a draw, but let's back it up and try and cover let's see what happened then we'll try and my plan and see if that if that wins for black okay so that those last games so no more distractions so I'm thinking at this point the black king needs to get to e5 when we want to tie this king down to here and this here and we want where do we want this knight posted well a good useful square uh, it's gonna take a while to get there is c7 well why c7 because then black has an impedric in, in, in uh, I can't even say it impenetrable blockade white has no way to get in uh, b4 and c5 are covered by the pawns a6 b5 and c5 
or, or not c5, a6, b5, and d5 are covered by the knight. Black does that, then he can move, maneuver the knight at his, at his uh, disposal. Tie the white king down, redeploy the, uh, the knight to e8, and put him on d6, and white's defending this thing. White runs out of pawn moves, game over. Let's see if that's possible. I, I can't say I'll prove it. Uh, there's always a, a myriad of ways to play these variations, but let's see how it goes. Okay, now, this might be a mistake, because why? First off, every time you move a pawn, you weaken a square. Now, suddenly, you've given white an entry point. Now, white may never be able to use that entry point, but you've given it to him. Second thing, you put a pawn on the target, uh, where it could become a target of the light-squared bishop. That bishop was never going to be able to attack that pawn on a5. And here, uh, white elects his trade pawns. Maybe he's happy with a draw. And now he... Um, the black weakness is eliminated. Black still doesn't have any entry points for his king, other than e5, which I come to, come to conclude was definitely playable. Now black starts spending pawn moves, and he's going to run out of them. Well, white runs starts spending pawn moves too, and we just kind of wiggle waggle a little bit. And now that black has put his pawn on e5, he's lost the e5 square for his uh, king. And, uh, you know, Black's probably happy with a draw. I don't blame him. But, hey, when you can win a game, why not? So it looks like Black's playing for a draw here. Black's trying to trade off, uh, trade stuff off. And he's succeeding. And looks like he's now, uh-oh, we have entry points for the White King. Has Black gotten too clever here? Well, he ties his king down. Okay. And now the game ended in a draw. Okay, let's back it up to a5 and try to find out if the position after a5, if black can play this for a win using my method. Okay, so white plays a3. So what's the first step? The first step was to get the knight, uh, get the knight to d7. Okay, I'm sorry, c7. Now how do you get to c7? Let's trace a path. Well, we got to get to e8, so we can go 1, 2, 3. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this, but we're going to try it. Now, what can white do? Well, if white wants, he can throw this move in, and we'll just go ahead and do it. Okay? We're doing it for a reason. Because it's putting the black king closer to where he wants to be. Now, this guy comes here. Uh-oh. Suddenly, we've let the white king in. So, maybe my plan doesn't work. How do we get him out of there? Uh, well, we don't want to push e5. That that takes a square away. We want the king there. How do we get the king there? Well, you got to be careful about a move like this. Why? Because then white uh, stalemates the black knight. Although, that might not be a bad thing. Let's see. Knight here. Bishop takes. King takes. Uh, I don't know. It seems to me that black has all the winning chances here. I'd have to pull out pawn endings by Auerbacher Mazilis to, to uh, tell you more. But uh, black can't be losing this. Uh, so let's see. Let's try to go back. Let's try to... We want to get a knight to... Uh, we want to get the king to e5. So maybe his going... Here's... What if you take with the knight... Let's back it up even further. Let's just take with the knight. Now the king's threatening to go to e5. This saves a whole lot of tr tr uh, time. Now, mission is going to be accomplished pretty quickly. See, the king's on e5, and white has to immediately defend it. And now, if you put the bishop here, this bishop becomes a, what we call a tall pawn. Now, the key is to get the knight to d6. Looks like it's got a quick path there. Now, can white generate anything? Probably not. See, look, at there's that knight d6. c5 is covered, b5 is covered. Now, we've got white tied down. Not hard to do. Just look for a plan. Now, you want to put... You want to put white in Zugzwang. Can can it be done? Well, the problem with a knight is a knight can't lose a tempo, but a bishop can. So, uh, if 
Black moves his knight. White gets a free move with his bishop. So maybe I've gone the wrong way with the knight. Let's see. Where'd that knight come from? How about, how about if we go here? Now you're threatening to take this thing right off. Although this does possibly give white some entry points. Let's see. Uh, let's go back here. Okay. Can black win this? <laughs> I think he can. I think theoretically black has the win, but trying to prove it is going to be a chore. I'd love to play black here. Uh, I think anybody would love to play black here. What if, since we've got white tied down, what if we put this pawn here to take b5 away? Now white's relegated to pawn moves, so he has to start making them. Let's, let's make one. Now we're going to go here. Now this comes in. Okay, well that's fine. The new target. Okay. And it's also helping white run out of pawn moves. See, if white runs, if white runs out of pawn moves, white has to move, uh, move something. So he's got to just slowly but surely creep, creep his pawns up. Uh, now, is there anything to be had with knight b5? It frees, it frees, uh, the bishop or the king. Let's, let's make some pawn moves of our own. Let's play g6. Okay, now h4. Uh, h5. White's running out of pawn moves here. Even though we're going to be putting them on dark squares, or light squares, White can't get at them. And just like that, White's in Zugzwang. So now White has to give up the pawn. I was talking about this earlier. Uh, white has to give up the pawn, then Black ha will eventually create a center pawn. So now White gives up his pawn. Well, wait, White has... White can play this move. He's not Zugzwang. God, I'm blind. Ugh. Uh, so before White weakens his queenside pawns, he needs to adopt this strategy. And you know, I was think you know, I was thinking this bishop was just a tall pawn there, but uh, maybe white has maybe white can hold this. Uh, you know, he, white shouldn't be running his pawns on the queen side. Uh, just back this guy up. Uh, although if I want to play anybody here, I'd play black. But it's a good thing. It's a good thing to analyze and. Uh, I'm going to end this video in a moment. It's uh, an hour and 13 minutes. That's plenty of time for somebody who want to watch it all. But this is one way you get better at chess. You analyze a position like this. And I don't always uncover everything quickly and perfectly. Uh, if I was, I would be world champion, right? So would you. So we're trying, we're trying to learn. We're trying to get some understanding uh, for how to conduct a game and try to find a, a way to effectively plan your end game. And then we, since we're aware of the plan that black is trying to conduct, I'm trying to construct a defense for white. If I can construct a defense for white that holds, then my, my line doesn't work. If, if I can't construct a defense for white that holds, then my line wins. And that's much like you play a game of chess you, at any stage of the game. If you see more than your opponent and you assess the position correctly, uh, chances are you're going to win. But there's plenty of plenty of uh, it's, it's just a wonderful position to study chess with right here. Uh, Black's got the better position, but but can he win? And again, like I say, Magnus Carlsen will pick this thing up and say, "Yeah, Black wins." Like ba 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 ba. <laughs> well, I'm not as good as you, Magnus. I never will be. But please indulge us with games where you do prove stuff like this, okay? For our enjoyment and betterment at chess. Thanks all for watching. Uh, Chiron's got a is a tremendous player. I'm sure he's a tremendous teacher. Give him a try for a lesson, okay? Get, he'll get you on the right path. He'll accelerate your learning, and uh, and we want you all to be as good or better than we are. All right, all right. Thanks everyone. Take care.